Today's webinar is, again, Population Norms and Prevalence of Frailty Among Middle-Aged and Older Canadians. Um, so finally, uh, let me introduce our speakers today, Dr. Olga Thieu uh, and Dr. Mario Ulises Perez Zepeda. Um, Dr. Uh, Thieu is an assistant professor of physiotherapy and geriatric medicine at Dalhousie University and holds the Canada Research Chair in Physical Activity, Mobility and Healthy Aging. She is also an affiliated scientist in geriatric medicine and the Nova Scotia and with the Nova Scotia Health Authority and an adjunct senior lecturer of medicine um, where, with the University of Adelaide in Australia. Uh, her research interests include aging, frailty, and physical activity. Um, and Dr. Mario Ulises Perez Heda is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Medicine at Dell as well. His research is focused on aging, in particular the interplay between geriatric conditions and its determinants at the population level. He is specifically interested in frailty in the older adult and has focused in the last in the past in Latin American older adult cohorts and more recently in data from CLSA as part of um, as part of his postdoctoral work. So with that, I will uh, take myself off the the uh, talking. So if I need to deal with any more of my children, and I will pass it on to our presenters. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for inviting us to present uh, today on our project uh, using the CLSA data that was actually funded by Research uh, Nova Scotia. I will start with, uh, first of all, wishing everybody that is well and safe while watching us from their home, hopefully. Uh, we'll start with uh, the introduction of our project, and then Ulysses will talk about the methodology and the results. And then I will finish with some discussion around our research uh, findings. We have no disclosures. Uh, we know that uh, people age at very different weights and with different rates. And some people are very healthy until they reach the oldest old, whereas some other people are very unhealthy even from middle age. The concept of frailty was introduced to capture this heterogeneity in aging. Frailty is a state caused by cumulative decline across multiple physiological systems. And because of this decline, people with higher levels of frailty are vulnerable to multiple stressors, physiological, psychological, and environmental factors. We can, have of, we can think of a heat wave or an infection like the one that's going around. And we can, uh, even though we don't have evidence yet, but we expect that people with higher levels of frailty, they're more likely to experience complications uh, from the infection and COVID disease and potentially are more likely to die after, being, uh, after having the COVID disease, COVID-19 disease. Uh, we need to think of frailty as a continuum with extreme fitness on one side and extreme frailty on the other side. Uh, as we're getting older, we're moving across this continuum and this has happened across a uh, life course. But more important, we need to stress that frailty is reversible. We know that even in people with higher levels of frailty, uh, it's very potential to reduce their uh, level of frailty to a lower level. There are two main views of frailty. Uh, the first one is the syndromic approach that sees frailty as the frailty phenotype. And another one is the deficit accumulation approach that we will talk today for our presentation. Uh, here we have an example of someone uh, around the age of 50 where they are moderate frail and how they look like 10 years later when they become severely frail. Uh, we can think of uh, each circle represents our body system, our body parts, and how each circle represents a node, a different component of our body, which when it's healthy, represented by a white circle, whereas when it's damaged, it's represented by a blue circle. We all accumulate some damage as we're getting older. And if someone receives, uh, gets to the moderate frail state, you can see they already have accumulated already some damage. This is just an example. But uh, <clears throat> some, this person might have, uh, uh, have some abnormal sodium levels, abnormal glucose levels, and some impairment in mobility. 10 years uh, later, this person might have accumulated even more damage. And for example, they might have now experienced some uh, cognitive impairments. To 
quantify how frail this person is, we can look at how much damage they accumulated. The way to operationalize frailty based on the deficit accumulation approach is by creating a frailty index, which is focusing more on the number of health problems people have rather than the nature of these health problems. Uh, the variables that are included in a frailty index are rarely pre-specified, and there are some criteria on how we screen these variables. However, we know that at least 30 variables need to be typically included in a frailty index. And to calculate the frailty index score of a person, we simply need to divide the number of health problems this person has by the total number of measures. Uh, this shows two people, person X and person Y, who have the same age, uh, around 65, but they have very different frailty level. One person close to 0 0.04, the other close to 0.14. Uh, the person X has a frailty index level similar to what, on average, people have at the age of 45, whereas person Y has a frailty index level similar to what, on average, people have at the age of 85. And because of this, uh, the frailty index has been uh, suggested that could be also be used as a marker of biological aging. Research on frailty has increased a lot over the past years, especially since the early 2000s. And we see an exponential growth of research studies published on uh, frailty from population health studies to clinical studies. And we don't seem to expect that this growth will stop in the near future. This is just a limited list of uh, studies that frailty indexes have been constructed on their data uh, from our group and many other groups worldwide. And as I said again, this is just a limited list. There is a lot more studies that uh, have already including frailty indices. Uh, this is just from Canadian data, US data, European data, and other studies across the world. In a scoping review we did on uh, frailty studies in acute care, we found that the three main frailty tools that are included in, the, in this uh, studies in hospitalized acutely ill older adults was the clinical frailty scale. The second that is missing from your slide here is actually just supposed to say frailty index and the frailty phenotype. And all these three tools were equally used in across the studies that we found. The association of frailty index uh, with various outcomes has been exam examined widely and typically showing that the higher the frailty level of a person, the more likely they are to experience adverse outcomes. The most commonly used outcome and examined outcome is uh, mortality. And this meta-analysis that was published in 2018 showed that the pooled hazard ratio for the frailty index was 1.04 which uh, we can say that for every 0 0.01 uh, increase in the frailty index, the mortality risk increase was 4%, which might be seem slow, uh, small, but uh, the increment for the frailty index increase is only 0 0.01. So we can expect that if someone uh, increased the frailty level, let's say from 0.1 to 0.2, then there would be a major change in the mortality risk. Also, we have to remember that frailty is not only something that applies to older age and middle age. Also, it could be useful for studies that examine younger people's health. Uh, the Kaplan mirror curves here are showing the survival probability for different levels of frailty. Uh, the lines uh, for the older people are nicely separated from each other, showing that people with higher levels of frailty especially above the, uh, above the cut point of 0.4, which is where a typically severe frail level starts, are uh, having the lowest uh, pro survival probability. Middle-aged people also, we can see a nice separation of the lines. Uh, for younger people between the ages of 20 to 40, we don't uh, see as high levels of frailty as we see in the other age groups, but still we can, there is a significant amount of people who have a frail index score above 0.2, and for them, the survival probability is lower compared to the other frailty groups. Frailty indexes could also be used as outcome measures in the studies. And for this study we did with cardiac rehabilitation data, we looked at the frailty index scores of the people at admission to the program and also at discharge. 
And we found that on average, people who participate in the programs experienced a decline of, on average, was 0 0.07, which is considered a significant change and clinical meaningful. Uh, we recently published or we recently submitted a paper that showed that the minimal important difference in the frailty index is 0 0.03. So we can see here that the, the reduction we saw in the cardiac rehabilitation program was above this minimum change we expect in the frailty index to be meaningful. Frailty indices are also could be useful for clinical care. Here you can see two people of different frailty levels and how they experience a stressor. For example, a urinary tract infection or it could be other infections. A non-frail person would uh, experience a small decline in their function and then quickly recover back to their baseline state. A frail person has a much bigger reduction in their function and a much slower recovery, and they may never even go back to their baseline state. And frailty is challenging our, mod uh, our current uh, medical healthcare system. Uh, this map here shows how the divisions are spread across our hospital in Halifax, and I'm sure this is similar to other hostels in Canada and uh, worldwide. When our current healthcare system was designed in the 60s, the median age of the population was around 25, and less than 10% of the population was 65 or over. At that time, the typical patients had single problems, and our system has worked greatly and very efficiently for treating these single problems. Uh, currently, if you have a heart attack, the system will work extremely efficiently. There will be an ambulance arriving at your house in a very short time. You'll be going to the hospital very fast. You'll be in the operating room extremely fast, and you will have possibly have a great recovery and going home soon. However, this is not what we currently see in our typical patients. Uh, currently in our system, the typical patients have met uh, multiple medical and social interacting problems. So our system has changed a lot since the design of uh, the beginning of the 60s. Now the median age of the population is 41, and almost 20% of the people are over the age of 65, and they typically have multiple problems. And we can complain that uh, our patients do not match our current healthcare system. We need to change our health, current healthcare system to fit our current patients. There are some advantages on uh, using the frailty index over some other frailty tools. Uh, one main advantage is that it can be done by using data from almost any existing comprehensive health uh, data set. It includes multiple domains, and the, because of this, it's considered a comprehensive assessment of health. It provides a continuous score from fitness to frailty. It doesn't just provide two levels, frail, non-frail. However, we can capture a lot of different levels of frailty, like mild, moderate, severe, and very severe frailty. Uh, it could be used as a predictor, but also it could be used as an outcome measure. Because it's a sensitive measure, it does not have a ceiling or floor effect. Uh, rarely people have a zero on the frailty index, and uh, it's extremely unlikely that someone has a frailty index score of one. Actually, the maximum score we typically see is around uh, 0.7. If we are interested to examine the association of frailty with uh, comorbidity, for example, we can exclude comorbidities from the frailty index. So the frailty index could be modified based on our research questions. Uh, we also can, uh, even the fra frailty index is quite, could be quite different across studies. It allows us to compare different populations in different studies. And finally, we don't have to depend as much on uh, uh, imputation methods for missing data because it allows us to work with this missing data. Uh, the main challenge is that at least 30 items need to be included and it takes uh, some time to collect this data and also some recording has to happen for this data. Our first uh, protocol that our group published in 2008 uh, gave some general guidelines about how to construct the frail index. We're currently working on an updated uh, guide about uh, creating a frail index with existing health uh, data based on the evidence that we have from all these years and also to some, give some more specific instructions.
the five main criteria when deciding which items should be included in the frailty index are that these items have to be health related, the prevalence of the deficit should increase with age, the deficit should never be too rare or too common, we need at least 30 variables, and they should cover multiple, uh, several organ systems. So we should not create a frailty index, including only, for example, cardiovascular uh, measures, then it becomes a cardiovascular index and not a frailty index. So I'm just going to briefly mention the 10 steps that we used to create the frailty index, and Ulysses later will show how we did that in, uh, in the CLSA database. First, we select uh, all health-related uh, variables. For example, we exclude demographic and social variables from the frailty index. Then we exclude variables who, which have more than 5% missing data, and we decode all variables to 0, 1. Uh, for example, 0 represents as absence of a deficit and 1 the presence of a deficit. Uh, we exclude variables that have a proportion of, uh, prevalence of deficit that is less than 1%, or over 80 percent. Uh, we looked only for variables that have a positive association with age. Uh, we exclude variables that are extremely highly correlated with each other, showing that maybe they were almost measuring the same thing. And then we count how many deficits remain to make sure that we have at least 30 items. Uh, in the final steps, we calculate the frailty index scores for uh, the participants and we test the characteristics of this index to see if they, uh, show, uh, if they behave the way we expect. And finally, we use the frailty index for our research questions and our analysis. And uh, with this, I would like to introduce the three objectives of our research project using the CLSA data. Uh, our first obje objective was to provide a standardized frailty index using the CLSA data. We then wanted to describe the frailty levels of Canadians uh, between the ages of 45 and 85 and provide some normati normative uh, data for frailty for Canadian people. And I will pass this to Ulysses to talk about our methodology and results. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share our results. So as you already imagine, we use the CLSA data of course, and this is a cross-sectional analysis from the baseline assessment. We uh, used both cohorts. We tried to have a frailty index that was useful both for the tracking and the com comprehensive cohort that would give us a common frailty index to be used whenever the pool data was needed. So that's why we did. We had this proposal approved uh, long time ago, and these are results of this. this is I will walk you through, as Dr. Theo mentioned, through the steps that we followed in order to have our frailty index for the CLSA. So, of course, selecting the health-related variables, the coding, screening of those coded, already coded items, frailty index calculation, and some other steps we will walk through through this presentation and methods results. So, first of all, we needed to went through all the health-related variables that were available in both data sets. So that's a, a really big data set. As, a, as you can see in this slide, you will find that both cohorts have different variables, uh, a more rich, of course, more comprehensive number of variables health related in, uh, are available in the comprehensive cohort, but also the tracking cohort has some other health related variables that could be used. But we uh, were uh, wanted to use those that were shared by, by both cohorts. So that was our first step, going through each and every one of those health related variables in both cohorts and then choose only those who were common for both. both. Over. So this is how our screening went. To, uh, uh, since we have 75 items that were common for the tracking and the comprehensive call, we started from there. So we included 52 items. We ended on that. I will be more specific on that. And 23 items were excluded 
basically because of no correlation with age. I will show you some graphs on that. We ended with self-rated health, vision, and hearing, some a list of, of chronic conditions, activities of daily living, instrumental activities, cognitive function measured by test, and mental health uh, items that mainly were from the depression uh, data, set, data that we have available in CLSA. So I want to show how this works, how the steps work, so we can go step Step one, we already did it. Health-related variables were chosen. Then we have the, the steps two through four that Dr. Phil talked about. So the first one is about the missing values. So how many of of this of this question in particular was missing for the whole sample? So in this case, we have really really low. Uh, number uh, percentage of, of missing values, so it's included. Then we codify. This is an easy one since it goes into one and zero binary. It's quite easy. Then we check the prevalence. In this case, it's not too common. It's it's not too rare. It's 20.8%. 20, 20 so then we go into checking our correlation with age. As you can see, cataract is one of the best correlated uh, variables that with age and we decided this is how we decide into including one variable or not as you can see here you have we have self-rated health this is a, a, a different example for the coding we all know or if you have worked with the frailty index previously that you can do uh, these cutoff points or these different scorings According to already established points, like this Likert scale, you can go from zero to one having some middle points for this one. Again, we check the missing, we check the prevalence, and we have here a slightly not that uh, flashy correlation as the other one, but it's quite uh, still correlated with, with age. So this one goes in. And this is an iterative process that, as, we, as I showed in the previous uh, slide, so we went through these 75 slides that were common for the both cohorts, but of course there were variables that didn't make it, right? So as we can, as we can see in this slide, the variable, this is from the data set of the post-traumatic stress symptoms. From this data set, we show the nightmares associated with a traumatic event, as you can see, it is not related. It is negatively related with age. And even that has a, a nice prevalence, not too common, not too rare, and a missing value that is well, uh, almost good, it's good too. Correlation with age precluded us from including it into our frailty index. So that's why, how we went and finished with a 52 uh, items frailty index. However, we had to do some concessions to our uh, frailty index since we have very low prevalence of some items such as the Alzheimer's disease. This was of course expected to be the case in this first baseline assessment because well, as an example here, we have a prevalence of 0.1%, so, so it's uh, apparently rare but we expect that this will grow this uh, prevalence will grow in the follow-ups in addition we also have to make this difficult decision on cognitive tests since uh, they had more values missing than commonly so we had to went up to 12 percent uh, be a little bit permissive in order to fulfill that criteria of having a multi-dimensional frailty index. That's why we decided on having also uh, be a little bit loose with, with, this, with this criteria. Of course, we went to this step of calculating the frailty index. Since we ended with 52 items in, in our frailty index, uh, we expect that a person, for example, with 15 problems 
divided by 52 would have a score of 29, as the sample depicted here. Keep in mind that uh, we respected this rule. Participants who had the 20% or more missing items for that individual in particular would have to be not included. In our case, we just had only 87 individuals that uh, had uh, more than 20% uh, of their variables in their frailty index not available. That is less than 0.1%. Uh, so, for, uh, continuing with the steps, we needed to make some tests on this frailty index. That uh, descriptive characteristics uh, are quite useful in order to know if the, our constructed frailty index has the properties that usually has. I will show you. Uh, in a later graph that what this means. Uh, of course, assessing the, the, the frailty index correlation with age, the full frailty index with age. And we did uh, norms deriving a quantile regression for percentiles uh, and using this, using these fitted values for age and sex. So we could locate the score on a particular fitted percentile. I will show you our graphs. We used a, a strategy with colors in order to depict those in green could, that could be in better shape and those in red that could be in or are in uh, highest score of frailty index. Therefore, having a higher burden of frailty and over, uh, over uh, overall world's health steps. We will uh, see this in a few more slides. Of course, uh, we all use the weighted analysis every time. Uh, since I said we didn't follow all the rules for this FI with 52 items, we had to do a sensitivity analysis in order to assess the agreement between both tools. So we needed to know how they correlated, a raw correlation. We needed to know also if the groups of intervals changed be, uh, between the two FIs. Also, if these groups, uh, as, as I told you with the norms, these percentiles, these fitted percentiles also change. So we did it a weighted kappa for that. And we did also limits of agreement of the whole score with a Deming regression that accounts for the error between the two measurements. Finally, we go into our results. As you can see, well, of course, as expected, uh, the majority uh, is a female. And we have a distribution of age that is uh, more uh, percentage into the 50 to 54 group. But I would take uh, focus your attention on the frailty index that we have here. So the mean overall frailty index is 0 0.08 for all the population. And as expected, it's a little bit higher for female. And also as expected, since uh, as the age is higher, the frailty index goes higher. So going from a 0 0.05 mean frailty index to a 0.13 frailty index in those 80 to 85 years old. This also can be seen in, in this, uh, sorry, no, that will be in the next slide. This other slide shows the property of the distribution of the frailty index this is a typical distribution of the frailty index. And in the second column, you can see the correlation with age. Of course, as the frailty index increases, or as age increases, the frailty index increases too. This was I talking about uh, before. You can see here this distribution how it modifies as the uh, population depicted is older. So it, it tends to normalize somehow as 
uh, you are older. And you can see also in the second column, the graph on the second on the right, uh, how women has this slide slightly higher relative the index two. All these first analyses are like the proof of how the frailty index uh, behaves as we expect to behave. I mean, higher in the older ones, a little bit higher also in, in females, and with a clear correlation with age. Then we go into the intervals. As you can see here, we have intervals of uh, categories of frailty index less than 0 0.1, 0 0.11 to 0 0.2, 0.21 to 0.3 and 0.31 or above. Of course, what we do expect is that as we are older, the fractions of those people, the percentage of people in the worst status, in the highest frailty index groups will grow. And of course, as you grow older, those in the best or the fittest group, the green one, it, it, tries, it starts to decrease. Finally, I, I am showing you the graph that is for the norms. The, this is the graph for the norms. What you are seeing here are plotted, fitted percentiles for age and sex. This graph in particular is for female. And you can just quickly take a look if you are a 74 year old and have a point to a frailty index, how are you doing? Just having a quick look into this graph, a similar thing that is done like in densitometry. We try to make visual this increased risk. Also, you have the raw numbers. If you want to go and see exactly what that number means, so. We have it here. If you are a 50 year old woman with a 0 0.03 score on the frailty index, you will be in the 25th percentile for your age group and your sex. That means you are into the best categories, into those who are fittest for, for these groups, CLSA, for Canadians. Finally, we did the sensitivity analysis in which you can see we used a 40 item F5, 12 items that were in included in the, uh, the other F5 that I show you were not used because uh, of missing or prevalent. The raw correlation was 0.99. It's really, really quite high. Uh, categorical F5, the F5 intervals were, was 98% agreement with a cap of 0.77. When comparing the norms, we also have a high agreement with a 97.9% of agreement and a cap of 0.93. This is quite good. Uh, when you can see with this little one with the hand, that means that if, if the person change of group, uh, how big was that change? So the mean of the change by group was only 0 0.04. So it's not that bad. And the regression shows us also a, a high coefficient between the errors of, of both. We also can see the bland Alman plot to your left that shows this is a really, really small uh, limit of agreements for our two frailty index, the one of 52 and 4. Finally, I can say from what I showed you, uh, limitations, well, all, of course, these are values or normative values for Canadian people, individuals. And the limitations particular to this data set is that people from living in long-term long care facilities or with cognitive impairment were not included into our uh, study because that's the way CLSA is, and that will give us maybe a higher FI for uh, for our if we would, would have included them, and of course prevalence should could have been also altered by that. So now I uh, 
pass the mic to Dr. Theo. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, so we we try to think about these results and who else could this be useful? This new standardized frailty index that we created for uh, the CLSA data and this uh, normative data. We had uh, we believe that uh, this could be quite useful for CLSA researchers, people who already have access to the CLSA data. They could use this uh, standardized frailty index as an independent variable in uh, regression models on other predictive models, uh, also as an outcome measure, but also if their study is not focusing on frailty, uh, if frailty index is, the frailty index could also be used as a covariate for their uh, analysis. Uh, with permission, with CLSA, our paper is actually under review right now for this project, but with permission with CLSA, we will also share our syntax and code for the CFI so other researchers can uh, use it. Also, other researchers could be interested to use this frailty index for other studies, where new primary data collection studies. For example, someone might be interested to look at the association of frailty with another outcome in, commu in different communities, and they might like to test this uh, frailty index in their sample to find how the participants compared to a representative sample of Canadians that was included in uh, CLSA would be limited on the normative data that we have that only between the ages of 45 and 85, but we understand that this is a big part of uh, the studies that are being currently done in uh, Canada. Uh, also, the frailty index of the normative data could be useful for clinicians. Uh, we know that uh, many clinicians feel that uh, frailty assessment could be useful for clinical practice to inform uh, decision making. And these uh, clinicians could ask the participants to use a questionnaire including these frailty index uh, items that uh, it's approximately three pages long. And after they self-assess themselves, the clinician would know how, what's the frailty level of, the of their patients. Uh, policy makers could also use this data to understand the frailty levels of, uh, that we see in different communities in Canada and in the Canadian population and uh, make some projections about the aging of uh, Canadians. Finally, general public uh, might be interesting to self-assess the frailty levels in order to compare their frailty levels with other Canadians of the same age and uh, sex. Here, for example, uh, this is similar to the figure that Ulysses showed earlier with the normative data and the percentiles. For example, we have four people, two people of the same age, 50 years old, and two people of 80 year olds. So the 250 year olds, one has a frailty index score of 0.15, and the other has a frailty index score of 0.05. Uh, the man who, this is just for males, the man who has a frailty index score of 0.15 is frailer than 94% of the Canadian males of the age of 50, whereas uh, the 50 year old with a frailty index uh, score of 0.05 is frailer than 50% of Canadians of the same age. Uh, in the two examples of two 80-year-olds, uh, the person with a frailty index of 0.15 uh, is frailer than 75% of Canadians of the same age, whereas the person with a frailty index score of 0.05 is frailer than 90% of Canadians of the same age. So you can see here, similar to how, as Ulysses mentioned, how osteoporosis screening is done, someone could use the three-page frailty index uh, questionnaire that we have and identify what's uh, the frailty level and how it's compared to other Canadians. So we believe that this new standardized frailty tool and the accompanied normative data could be useful for researchers, clinicians, policy makers, but also for the general public. And uh, to summarize uh, some of the data that Ulysses shows, showed, you can see here that uh, uh, among the people of uh, 45 and 85 that were included in CLSA, most of them belong to the non-frail category, has a frail index score less than uh, 0.1, which is uh, quite good. It shows that most of the middle-aged and older Canadians are in a good health state. However, we had a significant amount of people into the very mild state and some people in the mild and moderate severe uh, categories. 
And as uh, we mentioned, uh, this is a parameter that shows uh, how the Canadian population between the age of 45 and 85 would look like if there were only 100 people. And the proportion of uh, the percentages that you see on your left and your right shows the proportion of people with at least a very mild level of frailty. Uh, for which, for middle-aged women, is 34%, and for older women, is 58%. For males, the numbers are still are a little lower, but still quite high. Uh, as you can see, for middle-aged uh, men, uh, more than a quarter of the population has at least a very mild level of frailty. Whereas for older males, almost one in two older men have at least a very mild level of frailty. This shows how frailty could be useful to capture these very early stages of frailty in order to prevent a further, pro further progression to a higher levels of frailty. So before we finish, we would like to acknowledge our trainees and uh, collaborators and our funders, and especially Research Nova Scotia, which uh, funded this uh, project. And we'd be happy to answer any questions here at the webinar or through our emails. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you so much for that uh, very interesting presentation. I couldn't help while you were going, especially through your last few slides, thinking about um, you know how we how we have so many how there's so many different indexes that we use in a clinical setting on a daily basis, such as uh, BMI, and I can imagine that something like this um, and frailty indexes, you know, at some point be used in a you know in common pra common clinical practice, um, you know, for all the even though there are some, some controversies surrounding them, I think there's lots of utility there. So I just wanted to thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, I'd now like to open it up to questions. I see, I don't think anybody has uh, um, uh, submitted any questions in the chat box yet, so please feel free to do that. Um, just a reminder that muting will remain on, but you can enter your questions into that chat box in the bottom right corner of the WebEx, when, when WebEx window. Um, I also just wanted to mention that we'll be putting the poll up uh, about the webinar. Um, it's up now, actually. So if you do need to leave a few minutes before any additional questions get answered, please take a moment to um, do that now as well. So let's just go back to the chat. I don't think um, there's still any questions. So I thought maybe while we're, in case people are thinking about questions now, um, one question that I always tend to usually ask in these webinars at the end is if you've already started to engage with any um, knowledge users, so in this case it could be uh, clinicians or policymakers to actually move the index that you've created into either a, a clinical tool or a, um, its use in, in policy decision making. I'm just wondering if any of that work has started yet. I can go first. Uh, so because our, this paper is just submitted for publication and hopefully to be published soon, we haven't taken the next steps, but we definitely have plans potentially putting the questions with permission from CLSA, potentially putting the questions in a web app or some electronic format so it makes it easier for people to implement the assessment in clinical practice. We know it can be a little, there might be a little burden of answering a three-page question in, uh, in a doctor's office and then calculate a score. So we're hoping to make an online version for this. And we're also doing a little bit of work around the differences of frailty levels among provinces and making some specific uh, reports on Nova Scotia to understand a little bit um, better the levels of frailty in Nova Scotia and what it means in order to pass some information more to policymakers about uh, this. We haven't done this yet. We're still in progress, considering we just uh, finished our analysis, but it's in within our next plans. Um, I see there's a few questions now, so maybe we'll move on to those. And if um, uh, you can either just which one of you will answer them, you can decide amongst yourselves. Um, so I can. One oh, sorry. Yeah, I have read it, so yeah, I can answer the three questions. Go. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. So yeah, regarding the question, 
about multidimensional approach um, the, the Tilburg and Granningham frailty indicator from Daniela Anker. So uh, the frailty index is in nature multidimensional. So I think we depict a very well multidimensional uh, index. Uh, the Tilburg, as far as I remember, includes also some social uh, variables. We believe that those should be separate from the frailty index, and there's an, a social vulnerability index for that, that we also are working on that. Um, and that's, uh, would, I would answer for, for, with that. The, the question from Cheryl Sadowski. Can you comment on polypharmacy and medication burden and how does that is integrated in the FI? We, we can't uh, because there is not available uh, data on, on medication uh, currently from CLSA. But uh, as a clinician, my thought is that this is depicted quite well with using the, the chronic diseases. Uh, from Carmen Garcia Peña, thank you very much. Uh, how, how do I think? Uh, these pre normative values will change in countries like Mexico or Latin America. Of course, this will be, uh, I mean, this needs to be checked in other data sets and particularly in, in uh, countries, low and middle income countries. Because my hunch is that this will change change a lot. Um, that's uh, for, for now. So I don't know if Olga wants to comment. Yes, yeah, so the question about the 80% criterion that we used at the end, uh, calculating the frailty index scores, uh, we have to have a cut point, and I know sometimes we're a little more loose with this, especially for clinical data sets, because it might not be as reliable if only half of the data is being uh, uh, collected for some participants. We might say that we don't have enough information for them. It is typical that these are the frailest people because missing data is an indication usually of higher levels of frailty. Uh, so in this in population health data, since this is never a, rarely a problem. As she, Ulysses said earlier, it's less than 0.1% of the CLSA participants that we couldn't calculate the frailty index score. So it was, uh, if I remember correctly, a little more than 50 people. So it wasn't a big issue for the CLSA. It might be bigger for other data sets. And someone might consider pushing maybe the 80% cut point to a little better, a lower score, 70%, but they still need a cut point that needs to be picked. At some, uh, and that's when use people might start considering whether other methods like imputations or other things, if there's a high, very high number of uh, missing data. But typically we use the 80% cut point uh, for now. And the one thing about the Groningen versus Tilburg from work that we did before, Except the social uh, variables, pretty much everything else that would be included in Tilburg or the Groningen would also be included in the frailty index. So definitely the frailty index that we created is very multidimensional and would include more measures than any other frailty multidimensional tool that currently exists, with the exception of a set for the social variables that we include them in a social vulnerability index. Uh, yeah. This is you want to answer from about Mo the last question? Yeah, from Monica Kelly, if someone doesn't identify as male or female, how do you code? Perhaps not an issue with, with our older population. Well, uh, CLSA includes a uh, really nice set on, on gender, and we are looking into it, and we'll certainly make changes in, in the future with that, because they do ask a nice set of questions regarding this, so yeah. And to add to that is that's something we're extremely interested in because there's an interesting paradox happens with frailty similar to other health variables where even though males are higher mortality risks, females actually having higher frailty index levels. So this we need to understand this better, what's causing this paradox and whether it's driven by gender related factors, uh, how this relates with other biological factors. So we're interested to see how the gender might help us uh, understand these uh, relationships better. And this is actually interesting uh, in the current social media, the discussion that's happening around the COVID-19 too, showing that uh, males are more highly, uh, are more likely to die from COVID-19 and some recommending that maybe this is similar to what we see with uh, frailty.
I don't know if there's any more questions. I think you've done a really good job at answering all of them. I've just been following along. Uh, if there's any last questions, uh, please, anyone, feel free to uh, post them. Oh, actually, we do have one um, from Daniel Anker. I have one issue with the frailty index. In my understanding, it does not differentiate frail from multimorbid and disabled individuals. Can you share your thoughts about this? So maybe after this one, if we don't have any more, we'll slowly start bringing it to an end. Yeah, I can start with that. It's, as I said, it's a very different view of frailty compared to the frailty phenotype definition. And multimorbidity and disability items are typically included in the frailty index. And similarly, we see with other AIDS-related syndromes and geriatric syndromes, we see that the as someone has said, the package of all dates, uh, the problems of all dates come as a package. So it's really hard to take uh, one domain out from the other. Even so, we have done work before taking out multimorbidity and disability from the frailty index and showing that if you have enough uh, items, at least 30 items, the levels of frailty index would be similar with or without comorbidity and uh, disability. However, we do uh, understand that uh, multimorbid disability are great markers of uh, frailty and typically are informing us about the frailty level of individuals and that's why we typically include them. However, as I said, if the, for the purpose of research or clinical practice we want to keep them separate, you don't have to include them. They can be constructing frailty in it without including them. So I, I really understand Daniela Anker with these questions because uh, as a clinician I get really anxious when not having a, a clearness of, and, and this reduction is vision that we clinicians have. So yeah, as just adding to what Olga said, uh, this, this is uh, di difficult to separate concepts. Uh, and the, the older the individual is, the more difficult to differentiate and make differences between categories. So that really makes make sense because of that. And to add, it's to understand the overall health state of someone, it's a little, it's, it's might not be the best to ignore their level of uh, chronic conditions and their level of function. Is they quite informative about the overall health state? And that's the, the goal of the frailty index, is to be able to identify the overall health state of the individual in order to use it for clinical practice or for research. Thanks for that. Um, so I encourage if anybody else has any additional questions, um, you can still submit them and we can ask uh, um, for, our, for our presenters to follow up with you after the, the webinar. Um, at this time, I'd like to formally start closing the webinar and thank, thank you all of you for attending, first of all, today and uh, to our presenters for such a great participation. We really appreciate um, your efforts today and for everyone to be here um, in the CLSA webinar series. I'd like to remind everyone that CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. Uh, the next deadline for applications will be June 17th of this year. Please visit the CLSA website under data access to review the available data, further information and details about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete the survey that's located under polling. Um, if you don't see it beside the chat button, please click the drop down arrow and you should be able to see it. So our next webinar will take place on Tuesday, April 28th at noon Eastern time. Dr. Emily Rudder candidate, actually, Dr. Emily Rudder PhD candidate in the School of Public Health and Health Systems at the University of Waterloo will present um, and her presentation is entitled Social Support Availability and Executive Function in the Baseline Cohort of the Canadian Longitudinal Study. And we'll send, uh, the registration will open next week for that. And remember, the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at CLSA underscore ELCV. And finally, thank you again for attending today's presentation, and I hope everybody stays uh, safe and healthy.